Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Bavik. I'm calling from New Haven, Connecticut on Quinnipiac lands. Um, it's a super sunny day today um, and there's a crisp in the air. My window next to my desk is open and there's a soft breeze flowing in. Um, I just want to thank firstly everyone for being here. Like it's kind of wild that people would take time out of their day to like listen to me speak about our projects. And also thanks to New Public, Digital Playgrounds and Community by Design for having me and hosting this space. Um, just to kick things off, Soft Networks um, is an exploratory studio that's creating intimate social software. Um, we're very interested in how social software can be slow and small and built for and run by the people that use it. Um, and since it's the first time I'm ever presenting our work, I thought I'd share a little backstory. It's a little origin story, so, so bear with me through that section. Um, I grew up in India in a Punjabi Sikh family. Um, the Punjabi Sikh culture and tradition heavily emphasizes community. Um, the dining tables of my youth were often massive with, with tons of people uh, sharing roti and stories. Uh, with an open door that people would sort of filter in and out of. Um, this is a photo of a Sikh langar, uh, an open kitchen at, at Sikh temples where anyone can come and eat for free, where volunteers will spend hours cooking and serving. Um, and another part of my identity and my upbringing is I also grew up on the internet. Um, in some ways, Delhi didn't suit me. Um, and so my internet, the internet was my way out. I was I'm always obsessed, um, always really interested in internet communities, early Reddit user, um, randomly spent a lot of time on LimeWire, which was a peer-to-peer, -peer, let's say, file sharing app back in the day um, <laughs> that had a chat room that you could talk about Radiohead in. And so I did a lot of that. Um, and in this way, my identity has always been a combination of community and computing. Um, for the early part of my career after college, I worked at Google. Um, I wanted to go where I thought the best software was made. Um, and I took a lot of time there um, waiting for my green card and building social software. Um, and a lot of the products that I was lucky enough to spend time working on and built while I was at Google were great. It was kind of amazing to work on things being used by like millions of people every day. Um, but in many ways, it wasn't what I thought it would be. It wasn't this sort of like, it didn't feel like the spaces of my youth. Um, they felt sterile. Um, a lot of what I was doing was creating space for uh, people not to express themselves, but sort of adhere to brand expression. Um, instead of giving people small homes where they could live with their friends, it felt like I was building the world's largest hotel. Um, and so I left a few years ago and began to ask um, again, in many ways, can social software feel different? Can social software feel like a long walk in the woods with a friend? Can social software feel like the dining tables I grew up eating around? Can it feel like a home cooked meal? And um, spoiler alert, I don't have any answers. <laughs> I, uh, I think that soft networks is designed for me as a very, very long practice. I'm interested in it growing as a studio, but like an oak tree grows maybe um, over the course of my lifetime um, or, um, and to be responsive and emergent in its process. Um, and, and so I have three stories today uh, to share um, and hopefully we can all learn from them and get some answers together. And before I sort of truly begin, um, I just want to also say that I interchangeably use I and we pronouns, and, and that's also sort of in some ways an intentional decision. Um, a lot of the ideas here come from elsewhere, and I want to acknowledge that, you know, ancestral communities, BIPOC thinkers, many designers, technologists, and artists. I'm gonna do my best to represent their ideas, but I apologize for any misunderstandings or missteps. 
Um, but also sort of more practically, like, yeah, the studio is just me, but like, I don't work on really any projects without collaborators. It's a very relational practice. And so if I'm swapping between I and we, that's sort of, that's why that's happening. Um, I'm just going to take a second to open the chat just so I don't miss anything. But um, yeah, there we go. Cool. So the first story is a story about software for one. Um, you know, I'm going to take you all back to the pandemic. Um, it was 2020 and I was extremely sad and very isolated. Um, and, and to counter that, I was spending a lot of my time outside immersed in nature. When I was outside, I, I felt different. I felt expansive. I, my breath slowed down. Um, but then coming back to my computer where I wanted to spend time probing these questions, it just felt off. M my body became crunched. My, my, my movements were sped up. Um, and, and there was this tension between wanting to be outside and wanting to build software. And at the time, I was lucky enough to come across the work of Robin Wall Kimmerer, who was an incredible activist and writer and artist and observer. Um, and in her book, Braiding Seedgrass, she has this quote that I'll read. Paying attention is an ongoing act of reciprocity, the gift that keeps giving, in which attention generates wonder, which generates more attention and more joy. And through this quote, I began to wonder if my computer could bring me closer to the outside world instead of further away from it. Could my computing be a path into paying attention to the natural world? Um, I started to do a lot of research into this space, um, research into the many ways that we see plants, that we observe them and have over many years, um, and the ways in which the computer has been part of that process. This is an arena channel with like hundreds of links that on this topic that for some reason will refuse to load perfectly today, but I think you get the idea. Um, and through this research, I stumbled across this book called The Algorithmic Beauty of Plants and this idea of L systems. So if you spent any time with me over the past few years, you'll know that like, I'm like, I can't stop talking about L systems and it's fun to have a moment to reflect on why. Um, in The Algor Algorithmic Beauty of Plants, um, computational biologists lay out a language, a framework, a way to code that allows us to see plants. Um, L systems are sort of a mathematical formal language, i.e. like a programming language that describe plants. Um, but they don't just describe plants in one moment, they describe plants and how they grow. The language itself is self-referential and encourages you to think about the ways in which a plant moves over time. And so these L systems became a way for me to start to observe a plant and, and build a relationship with it over time. I became very, very excited about L systems. Um, I started drawing a lot of plants with code every chance I got. Um, I built this entire API that I thought one day I would publish and it would become super popular. I still haven't published it, um, and we'll talk more about that in a while. Um, I even spent a whole month writing unit tests, which for the programmers in the audience knows is like very, it's a very serious decision. I hadn't written unit tests for maybe five years, but there was something about this process that made me want to keep being more rigorous and keep putting in more care and attention into the work. One of the eventualities of this is this website, lsystem.club, which is a guide through which you can learn how to use L systems. Um, and a lot of my days, what I would do is I would, I would sort of work on the guide. I would go into the world. I would see a plant. I would come back and then I would draw it. I specifically remember this moment and this plant um, where I was in Prospect Park and, and observing this, this great oak tree. And I came home and in the tool, I was able to sort of represent my relationship to it. And, and it felt like, a true moment of expansiveness. Like I was outside, but still at my computer. Um, this journey kept going and is still going today. Um, I now draw plants to understand my culture. This is a lotus, um, which is very important in the Indian culture. Um, I draw plants to get to know local parks. This is a park in Los Angeles I spent a lot of time at that had a, an abundant um, array of wildflowers that I had a lot of, I have a lot of fun drawing, I had a lot of fun drawing. 
Um, this is a lilac that I thought it would be fun to have a lilac inflorescence grow in the brows. They're just random side note on lilacs. They grow in these huge shrubs um, that are incredibly like dense and vast. Um, but the actual inflorescence, the part in which the flower grows also has such detail and such structure. And it was really fun to focus in on that and give it space to bloom in the browser. Um, occasionally here and there, I got a chance to show this work. Um, I, I had a show on New Art City where I had a couple of pieces, very, very stripped down L systems of plants that talk about abundance, like the service berry. Um, Recently, I worked with the Processing Foundation to build a curriculum that would allow anybody who is interested to sort of approach this idea of learning to code and learning to observe nature through code. The curriculum is made up of little exercises. The first one, for example, is bird poses, in which you learn a few basic P5JS skills and then you go out into the world, do an exercise to observe, and then come home and sort of reflect on what you've learned through code. Um, but sort of, I think the interesting thing, or the, the, the point maybe of this section, is that I haven't really shown a lot of this work before, um, at least before today. A lot of the assets, um, images you're seeing, um, I'm not sure really anyone has ever seen them. Um, and, and I think there's a reason for that. I think that like this, this practice of drawing these plants, it, it wasn't art, at least commercial art. It definitely wasn't, you know, to make NFTs, um, even though a lot of people were at the time. Um, it wasn't a software product um, for people to use. Um, really, this was sort of the practice of software for one. It was the building of software as meditation the building of software as journaling. Um, you know, this gave me a new language to see the world. Um, it gave me a path to spend time with a community, in this case, a non-human community that I'm deeply curious about and invested in. Um, and I'm ending this section with this tomato plant that, that grew in my backyard here in New Haven last summer that I spent a lot of time pruning and, and growing. Um, and I'm really grateful for the bounty of tomatoes it would give me every few months. Um, but I'm also very grateful for the bounty of the story that it told me about how it grows and the story that I was able to capture through drawing the plant um, that still stays with me today. Um, so yeah, that's section one. That's my first little story, software for one. I got two more for you. Open for questions for what it's worth. I know we do questions at the end, but um, uh, so maybe we'll do that. But if anyone has anything really pressing they want to say, go ahead. Um, so we're in our next story now, which is software for two. Um, a few years ago, I was really, really, really lucky to meet an artist named Alice Swan Zhang, who is now a dear, dear friend. Uh, in her own words, you know, she is a media artist and cultural organizer who, amongst other things, uh, dreams of a relational web with phone lines to interspecies neighbors. You can kind of see why we get along. Um, after a, f uh, a few months after I moved to LA where she was living, she moved to Berlin. And we wanted to keep in touch from a distance, but like a Zoom call or a Google chat or like um, a, a digital office wasn't really cutting it. Um, and as relational artists, we wanted to explore other means of, of, of keeping in touch. Um, and at the time, we were super interested in internet protocols. Like it was around the time when everyone was reinventing the internet, if you remember about a year ago with new sort of decentralized internet protocols. Um, and we started to do a lot of research in the early internet protocols. Um, this is a diagram from RFC1, the first request for comment by the Internet Engineering Task Force that describes a client host communication architecture um, that became sort of the foundation for the internet as we know it. Um, but at the same time, we were also very interested in other forms of communication protocols, um, protocols for perhaps divine communication, where you ask a question, you send an API call and you receive an answer from a special mystical place. And the way you perform this API or this protocol is through ritual, through the act of attention giving. 
Um, there are many examples of this, I think, the Sikar Das, tarot readings, and I Ching. Inspired by both of these research areas, we decided to do sort of a little bit of a performance, uh, a performance where every day Alice and I would perform a protocol for remote connectivity over 15 days. And the way this works is that we'd ping pong back and forth and come up with a protocol and then the both of us would perform it and see how it feels. And so I'll walk through some of the things we performed. Um, one of my absolute favorites was this one. Calculate the angle between your city and mine. Walk 10 minutes in that direction from your house using your phone's compass. Send me that location on Google Maps. I thought of Alice the entire walk to the point at which I reached. I imagined walking across oceans and through our relationships towards that place. And where I ended up is this random place in Santa Monica, California, but it's not random anymore. It has special meaning to me. In many ways, it's become Alice and Mai's place, a representation of that moment in our relationship. Another day we drew protocols. Uh, we drew the protocols of our relationship. Um, we, we thought about the ways in which we, our interests led us towards each other and the mediums or sort of the, the, the APIs or the, the structures, the pipes through which those interests express themselves. Uh, on another day, we sent letters. And this is in some ways my favorite one because um, we were living in completely different countries around the world. I had never sent a letter internationally, which was kind of a wild thing. Um, and, um, and, and the letters arrived long after the performance was over. So in a way, continuing the structure of our remote connection. Um, one day we left audio messages for each other in a scavenger hunt across multiple apps that we shared space in. And sometimes I like to think when I'm opening Google Drive that perhaps I'll find a message that Alice left there that I never found, which is really fun. Um, at the end of our project, we put our exercises in a space that reflects our inspirations. And I'd like to walk through this now, but if you'd like to, you can walk through it on your phone or on your computer together. The URL is remoteprotocols.us or remoteprotocols.us. Um, and I'll read out some of the prompts because I think they're kind of fun. Um, missing someone from afar, consult this connection wizard for how best to reach them. Request a protocol. What does it mean to connect from afar in our present? As digital fatigue lingers and physical happenings spring back, what happens to remote connectivity? If you are missing a faraway peer, the wizard of one-to-one -one is here to offer a bit of guidance. Digital or analog, synchronous or asynchronous, the wizard will select a promising protocol for you. This will be an exercise for you and your peer to perform in order to experiment with remote connection together. Ready? Begin. Please bring your subject to mind. We're gonna do a version of this meditation later in the sandbox. What makes them who they are? Tune into their characteristics and traits. Rest one hand on your heart and the other on this screen. Protocol selected. Can't wait to see what we got. Soundscape. Take a photo or make a sketch of where you are right now. Annotate it with all the sounds you hear around you. So that's a protocol that if you'd like to, if you're missing someone, you can perform with them today and see how it makes you feel. This project made me think pretty differently about what software can be. Um, this is a photo of my dad trying it. And he really, he, he was chuffed. Um, a, a daily walk in the park could be communication software. Wishing someone a birthday, whether you're doing it in a hug 
or whether you're giving them a call on FaceTime is communication software. Um, these communication software differ from person to person, from relationship to relationship, and even from time to time in moments or seasons. For me and Alice, at least for me, I think my favorite protocol or my favorite ritual of all was actually making the project together. People may not use the website. Um, people may not read what we wrote, but perhaps the act of spending time and attention and representing that moment of your our relationship in a project was enough. And I think we're a lot closer because of it. Cool. So now we're on our last story. Um, and I think we're tracking well on time. We should have about 10 minutes left. Is that, is that correct? Cool. Um, so our, the last story is, is one that's still continuing in many ways, software for four. Um, a little while ago, I was a member at New Inc, which is where I met Raven. And it's an incubator for people working at the intersection of art, design, and technology in New York. It's associated with the New Museum. Super great vibe. Strong recommendation from me. Um, and while I was at New Inc, I was kind of talking a lot about platforms and how I was mad at them and wanted to make new ones. And, and, and in doing that, I sort of started having people reach out and say they too felt that way. Um, and through that process, I met these four artists, Molly Soda, Sarah Rothberg, Chris Cleary, and then that's me. Um, and I'm going to do a disservice to their practice by giving you quick bios of them. So just know that they're amazing and you should check out their work. They work in performance and streaming, education, and so many things. Um, but what, what's common amongst all of us, I think, is that we're all playing with notions of what a platform is. Um, what are platforms in which we exist? Um, and, and, and those interests, those notions led us to, you know, sort of this question of like, hey, what if we created our own platform for live streaming? We were all, we were all interested in live streaming and video in some form or the other. Um, and so we were like, what if we, what if we do our own thing? Um, and you can imagine sort of the next step that people would take is to like build a prototype and start playing with it and start hosting live streams. But if you've made it to this point of the presentation, you know that that's not what happened. Um, and instead, we spent two years talking. Um, Adrian Marie Brown has this incredible quote where she says, or they say that um, you should move at the speed of trust. And I think in many ways we did that. At first we moved at the speed of trust, but then we somehow slowed down even more. Um, every time we felt an impulse to build something, we stopped and we asked ourselves why and where is that impulse coming from? Um, the first thing we ever did was called season zero. And in season zero, our project thing, or is this thing on, was just a website that links to existing platforms, that linked to our existing performances on YouTube, Twitch, Amazon Live, and Chatterbait. Um, we wanted to put them all in one place, but we weren't allowed to because Big Tech doesn't allow you to iframe. And so we literally just had to have links to different spaces. In season zero, we wanted to see how it felt to coexist, but to be isolated. Uh, Molly streamed on Amazon Live, um, Sarah streamed on YouTube, I streamed on Twitch, and Chris did his Chrissy show on Chatterbait. What does it feel like for a user or a person to move between these distinct spaces? What does it mean to ask them to have different identities? What were the terms of service for each one of these platforms? And in what ways did those terms constrain us as artists and performers in ways that we might not have even recognized? What did it even mean to just be surrounded by the brand aesthetics of these various platforms? These were the questions that came up for us in season zero, where we just hosted live streams at the same time on multiple platforms. In season zero, we were deeply, deeply immersed in web 2.0, which was big tech platform. And so like a lot of people, we started asking, okay, what if we move into web three, into decentralization? What would that actually mean for us? What does it mean to not only build your own platform, but have it be decentralized? And we luckily got a grant from SeaChange and NextWeb, New Inc. Um, 
to, to sort of help answer those questions and think through that and figure that out. Um, and one of the first things we did was we were like, let's just do it. Let's just build a whole blockchain with, uh, you know, NFT vibes and a currency. Um, and, and pretty quickly, we learned that that didn't feel right, that this notion that Web3 means that there's commercial sort of um, relationships between performers and interaction and audience, that wasn't the version of decentralization that felt true to the many, 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 many hours of conversations that we had been having. Um, you know, so one of the things we did then is we just stopped and we held a workshop. Um, we held a workshop where we asked people like what they felt about platforms and live streaming. And we tried to understand what their perspectives on the next web or the new internet should and could be. Um, and over time we started building out um, what has now become season one and the Is This Thing platform. It's a space where each artist gets their own room where they can host live streams wherever they want and completely control the aesthetic of the room. There's no requirement um, for any sort of brand identity. Um, and each page is hand coded or custom coded to the artist. And so that was one form of our decentralization. Um, another one is we had different forms of interactivity. Um, the ways in which artists and audience interact is often controlled by the platform that they're on. And if we give artists the control back into how people interact with them, what new things do they want to do and what ways can they express themselves and, and build new relations with their fans and their audiences. Um, and we also allowed people to uh, sort of set the terms of service. Um, I forgot to talk about these rooms quickly. Started in an amazing room where they were an avatar performer and um, you, they were sort of thinking a lot about um, asking questions and letting the audience interact with questions, specifically questions about Web3 and the future of the internet. Um, Molly did an awesome stream where you could help her declutter or clutter her room. Um, and then in Chrissy's stream, which, I was, which is the last one I'd gotten to, um, you could add stickers on him um, uh, all over his body um, but the stickers would grow and grow and grow and slowly start to cover him until he picked them up. Um, and also, since he often uh, performs nude, we had uh, made it so that you had to scroll around the page to sort of access the entire frame. And then so we could control the terms of use or, or, or have sort of implicit consent built in. Last year, we ran a stream of season one, and it, it was awesome. It felt super be freeing to be in a space of our own creation. Um, and the performances themselves, which lasted for an hour, um, just, just felt really both cozy and expansive. But I think more importantly, the performance and practice of creating this platform was, was the work itself. Um, the performance of creating thing is the most important performance of all. Um, so we're actually doing a performance soon. It's currently scheduled for June 8th. Um, it's going to be another live stream. We have a couple of friends joining us as well. So if you're interested, visit thing.tube and you can subscribe for updates on our Instagram. And that's all the stories. So this is the part of the presentation where I talk about like what we learned and what the conclusions are and all that, sort of tidy it up. Um, and like I said at the beginning, I don't really have strict conclusions, but I have some loose thoughts that I'll share. I think I'm very proud of all the projects and websites and apps that were built through soft networks in this last year. Um, but, and this is extremely cheesy, but it's true. I think the real treasure was the friends I made along the way. Um, and that was really what I got or what I learned or what we, we gleaned in this first year. Um, and I know that that can come across as trite, but I think that there's something deeper to it. I think that today our communication rituals are guided by software. The way we talk is guided by the software we use. And I think this first year or so of practicing as soft networks has made me now want to ask, what if we molded software around our communication rituals? What does it mean to start with the communication rituals and then build software around them? 
And I want to make clear that I'm not the first person to say this. It's been said in the net art world. In this diagram, you can see a simple net art diagram from 1997 um, is, is a piece of work. And it talks about how internet art is less about the website, but about the relation between the artist and the user of the website or the artist and another artist. The network is the net art. Um, in design practice, movements like design justice and much of the work that New Public talks about is about centering the community first and really understanding its rituals before you build software. And most importantly for me, as a developer, coming back to who I was in high school, movements like the handmade web give me so much inspiration. There's so many moments in my life where I had a side project, and then at some point it became something else. It became a product, or, or, or I started looking at the stuff I was building for my friends and thinking of them as users. And I'm very interested in the idea of why that transformation took place. What happens if I just stop? the transformation from friend to user and just keep building just for my friends and keeping them that way. In the next phase of the studio, I'm very interested in continuing to ask these questions, but also now probing into this idea of scale. I'm very interested in a world where we have millions of more pieces of software for each person, community, and each ritual even that people create themselves and I want to know what are the technologies necessary to do this? How can I help people create their own soft networks? What are the cooperative business models that might encourage these sort of futures? And so with that, thank you for joining me. Again, just truly stoked and grateful that y'all would take time out of your day um, to be here and would always love to chat about this stuff. Um, so yeah.